thank you so much for all of our speakers. Um, thank you for everyone for attending. Um, oh, we have a couple more images here. Fair amount of time now for questions, comments, discussions to continue our exploration of design and ostentation on all of its materialities. So, who wants to jump in first? Not to spoil his parade, but there was also an anti-Calder reality going on at the time. If you read Thomas Wolfe, one of his great novels, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. goes to the party with Aline, yeah. his mistress in the West Side apartment, and, and Calder's creating craziness and a fire that risks everybody's life. And they're out in the, in the hallway, and he's just really dumping on Calder, this character. And, it, and as you showed us, he's the center of attention. I mean, you can't even be Picasso with Guernica. He's going to try to take that away, or the Barcelona chair next to it. Forget about that stuff. And then you've got the, uh, what do you call that, the, uh, the water display? I mean, that, that's like, you know, bringing in everybody, uh, Bernini, and you name them, I, I can top it. And then, uh, as you say, that was chosen because it would be the center of attention in an, a, a circular area where people would, uh, you know, count, act, act, react with. On the other hand, your photo of the crowd actually showed what I could see. They're really more interested in pressing the buttons mm -hmm. oh, yeah. than, than looking there. So maybe he didn't succeed so much. And your follow-up saying that, it sort of got lost. They forgot about him. They closed down the show, this and that. But then you brought him back mm -hmm. uh, with that beautiful photograph mm -hmm. of enhancement. So I just just wanted to maybe put in you know another side to what was going on in the Calder world. Sure. Well, and I can just add one little bit. Um, so in the his autobiography in 1966, when he is very dismissive of being part of this competition, he also makes the claim that. Um, because people, because the committee or the jurors knew him, that's why he won. So he did have this assumption, like it, it was he, he, you know, um, had an entitlement to be part of basically everything that he was, at, you know, applying for. And whether or not that's true, of course, we don't know. And this is an account decades later, and it's you know we have to take it with a grain of salt. Um, but I do think that you know there was definitely a, somewhat of an ego going on there, and a and a collaboration between an industrial designer like Rhodey, who was looking more for a collaborator, uh, meant that there was a bit of tension, I think. And I think the work does, in some way, represent that tension. So yeah, thank you. Um, so I guess this is for Danielle and Christiana. Um, I think seeing your presentations kind of close together um, had a really nice uh, kind of playing off of each other because you have this idea of porcelain um, being mass produced and it's something that obviously you don't throw away, like you keep it and you reuse it. But then on the other side, you have the idea of plastic and plastic being something that can be thrown away, but turning it into something that is m a more special with the idea of, of um, Calder's uh, work and turning it into the art. So you have art becoming um, mass produced and then mass produced becoming art. So I don't know if you guys wanted to maybe make a comment on that or it's just something I, I noticed by looking at both of your presentations mm -hmm. at the, you know, close together. <coughs> yeah, I mean, that's precisely the issue that at least in my paper I was trying to flush out, right? That it's uh, in, in industry and in mass production and this idea of, you know, multiple of things, right, repetition, that that is going to challenge the idea of what an art object can be as a singular authorial object. So when those two things come into contact with one another, as they do in porcelain, uh, it makes for some really interesting uh, commentary and, you know, luckily also objects that deal with that, right? People who are trying to flesh that stuff out. So it's an interesting moment to sort of dig into as a researcher. Yeah, and I, and I think what's also very interesting about um, this kind of interwar period is that you do have these reasons to be experimenting with materials that really disappears as soon as the war effort takes over industrial production. So the plexi so Roman Haas had plans for Gildy, uh, for Gildy, for Gilbert Rohde, I just put them together, for Rohde to um, produce plexiglass chairs. And actually one of them is at 
uh, MoMA, and there it was going to be a mass production of chairs that would, you know, grace living rooms, and then the war effort appeared and the chairs stopped, and plexiglass was rerouted to the war effort for years. So it, it does, that, that kind of move from industrial products to artwork did have this kind of culminating moment that very soon after takes a break, really, which is interesting, yeah. yeah. I'm gonna add to that. Oh yeah. Because I'm actually working with plastics in mind too, because Helen Dryden was involved with it. But it's, when plastics are first introduced, it's not that idea we have now of plastics of being disposable, and a lot of artists are incorporating aspects of plastics into their designs, like the mm -hmm. um, American Union of Decorative Artists and Craftsmen that I mentioned. Like A lot of people are using plastic knobs mm -hmm. or plastic clock casings, and so it's, it's very, very common, and it's actually, they're trying to when, elevate it from the very beginning. Mm -hmm. And so it's only later when it becomes cheaper to produce that it becomes mm -hmm. more disposable. Mm -hmm. Does Calder, I can't recall, does Calder ever incorporate the material into any of his sculpture? He does. He actually, um, he was working on a mobile soon after that included metal and plexiglass pieces, um, but it didn't become a major move for him. But there is, um, he's, he's described it in one source as one of the few artists that returned, of the competition, one of the few artists that returned to plexiglass as if he had a kind of relationship with it, but it didn't really take off beyond that, so yeah, yeah. Um, I was, so in your presentation, I saw that porcelain was sort of the ideal medium to aggrandize the proletariat because it wasn't elitist art, it was made by the worker's hand and it had function. Um, as well as um, uh, its function was its worth. So uh, to me, those are three things that are indic indicative of crafts in general, and I was wondering if you could highlight any other crafts that um, were similarly thought of during that time in, in Russia. Yeah, um, I know, for example, um, <coughs> I'm thinking of like black lacquer boxes, black lacquer painting boxes, if that's the right term for them. Those were um, similarly a historical, historically Russian uh, craft product that is also, um, I don't know this is history as well as the history of porcelain, uh, maybe someone else here does, as I'm hearing some like, mm hmm. Um, but uh, I know that those were also sort of repurposed um, during the Soviet period with different kinds of imagery and also kind of become uh, folk craft authentic Soviet objects in the 1930s. Um, oftentimes actually icon painters I know were hired to paint these black lacquer boxes. Um, so there are similar examples, although I think with less of an association with that elite, that elitist kind of fragile uh, history that comes with porcelain, um, but certainly other ways in which craft uh, craft is, is taken up in the 1930s. Um, also in craft appears, um, I'm thinking in like, you know, as Soviet nationalisms start to become a political project in the 1930s, so within Uzbekistan, uh, Kazakhstan, right, within that part of the region, those countries are kind of encouraged to develop their own craft cultures, so whether that's weaving, right, a lot of kind of hand activities, which is, um, was a way of rhetorically saying, oh, look, these are, you know, every nation has its own little craft, but also certainly just reinforcing a way of saying, well, you're not as sophisticated as us, right? You guys are still kind of working by hand to develop these things. So there's certainly structures of power that are within that as well. It's a great question. It, this is for Sarah on the cars. So how does the Helen Dryden relate to the damsels in design at General Motors? Yeah, so right? she's predating them by <coughs> about 20 years, actually. Wow. Um, after she's involved with design, there are not really anything else that comes up for women working in cars until the 50s. Um, there was a woman who worked in the engineering side of automobiles in the, the very early 1900s, but she wasn't doing design. She was actually doing like motor work. Um, but other than that, and that's why it kind of is a fascinating story, because if you actually read 1930s accounts of people working in the automotive industry, and like the GM's art and color section, mm -hmm. 
uh, they're very much to the no way, no women in automobiles. Mm -hmm. and it's not their place. And so it's. And even today, like doing the research for this, I'm <laughs> having to talk to a lot of people in the automotive world and bringing up this idea that she was involved in this project, mm -hmm. um, I'm finding resistance to that. But it is around the same time, I think I was talking about it with you last night, that mm -hmm. um, Sonia Delaunay yes. shows her clothes, photographs her clothes, wet models wearing her clothes with cars. Mm -hmm. And that is at the same time. Yes. So and and that's involved with the textile production. Right. And what I find that's really interesting about this is that she is involved with this actual hardware production as well. Because that moves her out of this association strictly with interior design. Mm -hmm. But the attachment of her name seems like it, it is purposely right to appeal to women the same way the use of models with the clothing next to the cars yes. would be, right? Yes, I right. mean, and in, so in all their advertisements too, yes. they often have like women in you know, long gowns. Yeah, you know. right. <laughs> Well, actually, I had a question, I guess, for uh, Christiana about the Soviet production. Um, there's also not just for Malevich's involvement with the production. I've seen there's like coffee pots that are kind of deconstructing, mm -hmm. which are attributed to him as the designer of the form. But what you were showing us was this other idea right. of taking supremacist compositions and, in some sense, I'm going to go on a limb and say ruining them mm -hmm. um, by uh, taking the the Malevich idea of eternal space of this kind of universal relationship right. of forms right. and sort of limiting it and transforming it into a kind of right. decorative design. Right. Um, and just as another thought, because it was just in mind, I had never seen that the black square used as a kind of corporate logo oh, yeah, of the suprematist brand. <laughs> yeah. It's fascinating yeah. to think of Malevich's work being so mm -hmm. reused and abused and yeah. reconsidered. What was his actual direct involvement with all of this? So he was, um, there was a short two year, maybe one to two year period at the Leningrad Manufactory 23, 24 when Malevich was actually hired um, to design for those tea services, in my understanding, to like make these drawings that would then be transformed, uh, transferred onto the services. Um, and in my understanding, um, Malevich or Kandinsky, they were already relatively well-known artists um, in Western Europe at that moment, um, also certainly, I think, within Soviet Russia. Um, so the idea that they would um, be exported abroad, right, in certain you know industrial fairs or art exhibitions, uh, different contexts, um, was really appealing, I think, to the manufacturer factory, which was seeking a kind of, um, certainly buyers, right, seeking an audience for these objects. Um, so I don't know exact details of his involvement, but he was certainly um, a member and like producing for the factory at that moment. So it was something that he was yeah. on board with. It wasn't kind of like taking over. Like, it's a yeah, good, yeah, it's, it's a good question. And I don't want to like overstate it. Maybe there's even someone here who knows more about it. Um, but it's, yeah, it's a great question. Yeah, I don't know really exactly. Uh, you know, if he was on board with it or if he just sort of had no other option, right? He needed, him, right? He sort of, you know, like needed employment and the more porcelain manufactory was hiring. So, you know, it's not like the gallery business was booming in, you know, 1923 post-Soviet Russia. So, um, yeah. So, but it's a great question. Yeah. That's great stuff, yeah. Yeah. Oh, here, do you want to, and then. Um, this is a question for Sarah. Um, I was wondering, First of all, I don't know if Studebaker participated in the 1939 World's Fair. Mm -hmm. They did. So the World's Fair, I know, was all about um, consumerism because that was to be um, a way to lift the country out of these big, heavy depression years. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was a committee for the participation of women at the fair. So uh, the fe female um, involvement was very much highlighted. And I was wondering if um, Helen Dryden was specifically featured by Studebaker for that purpose. Well, Helen Dryden was a member of that committee. Um, she, by 1939, she had ended her contract with student, or they had ended the contract with her, let's say. Um, and so she uh, was involved with the fair okay. to an extent. She applied to have some murals featured, but those weren't accepted. She was later in the game that she 
submitted those. Uh, at that point, it seems that her only real work that she was doing was as a style consultant for, <coughs> for Teague. Um, but she was a part of that committee. Okay. Lucy? Oh, I just wanted to respond to Ethan's um, inquiry about the relationship of art and design and manufacture. It just occurred to me that Murakami's Louis Vuitton participation recently and our 20, 20th, 21st century negotiation, right, of art into um, manufacture, into um, consumerism is a little bit interesting here, this foreshadowing of it in such a context as the Soviet mm. program. So mm. just to add yeah. on to your yeah. reflection. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just interested in how, how craft is being used as a, to define what process exactly. Mm -hmm. In other words, is craft supposed to imply like a folk tradition mm -hmm. that's then being woven in or is craft right. art? Um, you know, not necessarily you, but I just think right. it's an interesting thing because we yeah. think of craft so differently now. Right. Craft and art are being, right. s you know, right. so that's my question. Well, it depends, right, it depends on what it's being contrasted with. Um, so if craft is being, in the Soviet context, if it was, in this moment I'm discussing, if it was being contrasted with, um, with uh, mechanical reproduction of industry, it takes on a quality, we kind of think about it's, oh, but it's a singular person making this. So you start to think about the hand work of it. So you think about it in that way. Um, if it's being contrasted with art, you start to think about it as art, and if you're thinking about art as something that's right, autonomous, singular, right, then it starts to move kind of in the other direction and takes on different qualities. So um, it's just kind of fascinating to see how that uh, definition and those associations move back and forth. Um, it's it's endlessly fascinating. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Socialism, that kind of right. thing. Yeah. Right. Yeah, that, that was one of the things I, I found that fascinating about your yeah. paper too. That yeah. that since it's so ideologically important how you're right. defining these things, this right. distinction, because right. painting is so bourgeois, it's right. you know, self-indulgent, right. so you have to kind of make sure you're getting the right, right. label with the right you know, associations in order for it to be ideologically appropriate for the exactly. situation. Is this real? Exactly, yeah. yeah. And porcelain just becomes this medium that is able to do that. It's kind of flexible in that way, so. Well, thank you, everyone. I see I've got the microphone. I can do this. Thank you so much to our wonderful speakers, to Ulysses Dietz, who seems to have stepped off. But anyway, thank you to all of you for sticking it through to the end of this Friday afternoon session. Um, hopefully, this will spark further scholarship. Um, and uh, thanks, well, really thanks to everyone. Thanks to the Cooper Hewitt for hosting us. Um, and I. We'll close this uh, symposium, but um, we'll continue on, on other ways. So have a great afternoon, everyone, and it was great to see you all.